So continuing from last week, right? Continuing from last week, uh, which is good that we're we're talking about this now because uh, we're going to be doing some stuff with uh, uh, electricity in lab, which is actually going to be kind of fun. Uh, so uh, good thing we're talking about energy now. And so last week we were talking about potential energy and we we're talking about uh, kinetic energy. So let's talk about how, how there's this thing called the conservation of energy, okay? Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, right? It's kind of like the, the thing that says the other the – uh, other thermodynamic law that says mass cannot be created or destroyed. Well, well, neither can energy, right? Energy really is just changing from one form to another, right? Uh, for example, it can change from potential energy to kinetic energy and back back to potential energy again, right? The total energy of an isolated system remains constant, right? So if you have a system like a battery, for example, right? The energy in that battery going through, like maybe lighting up a flashlight remains constant unless the battery is dying. But it generally remains constant, right? And so um, that's why if you ever notice that, uh, if you have like a car battery and it's like running perfect all the time, I don't know if you've ever taken a voltage of a car battery before, but usually your car battery is like 12 volts, 12 volts. But then if you put like a, a multimeter on it, it reads like 13.9 volts. And so it can, it will, thir between 13 and 14 volts. And so when you put that multimeter on there, when the battery is brand new, it will stay like that much volts for a very, very long time. But as soon as it drops down to below 12 volts, like 11.5, right? Because the, the, the rule is it has to be remain constant. Your car doesn't start anymore, right? Have you ever noticed that? Your car was, your car won't start anymore, right? And so, um, and interestingly enough, that's, you know, batteries are chemical energy. So you can always replenish the chemicals again and, and you'll get the energy back. But anyway, the point is, right? Uh, the total energy of isolated system remains constant. So total energy at time one will equal the same total energy at time two, right? So if you're driving down the road and you're using your car battery and you're running at 12 volts, right, for an hour, then you ride another hour, it's still running at 12 volts, right? The battery is. Or the flashlight or whatever you're using, it uses a battery. Total energy does not change with time, okay? So your very first question, very first question for today is this. Which of the following is not true about energy? Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. The total energy of an isolated system is variable. The total energy of a system is, uh, does not change with, change with time. Or all of the above are true. Is it scanning this time, Carly? Wonderful. Wonderful. Make sure you scan the question and answer it. This is how I take roll. They've been harassing me, the administration, about taking attendance. So, but you all are still here, so I guess it's not a really big deal. It's, it's really about financial aid, right? And you're all still here. No one, no one's dropped the class, so really, it's the. The Department of Education wants their money back if you drop the class. <laughs> so that's why they want, that's why they make you take attendance. It's crazy because back in the day when I was in college, it wasn't that long ago, uh, there was no such thing as taking attendance. So, all right, has anybody, has everybody responded yet? It's not working? I got 21 responses already. Is that, I think that's everybody, isn't it? I'm pretty sure that's everybody. Okay, so with the 21 responses in, good job. The vast majority of you caught my trick question here, right? Total uh, is not variable. What is this word supposed to be? It's supposed to be constant, right? It's supposed to be constant. The total energy of an isolated system is absolutely constant and is not variable, okay? So, there we go. So I'm showing you this equation, but I'm not going to make you do any real math with it. Don't worry. Okay. So you can see here when I was talking before about potential energy and kinetic energy, the kinetic, uh, the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, right, of the first time at the first, you know, uh, uh, at the very beginning. There it goes. I was like, what is I trying to say? The very beginning is the same, is equal to the kinetic energy and the potential energy later on, right? Later on. Okay. 
And you can split these up into the different kinds of equations for potential and kinetic energy. Remember that kinetic energy is one half mass times the velocity squared of the thing that's moving, the object that's moving, right? And then potential energy is the uh, uh, the mass times gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, times the height that the object was up, right? High, how high the object was, okay? So the thing I just want you to know here, again, just this equation shows that at time one and at time two here, they're both equal, right? They're both equal still, just to demonstrate the conservation of the, the energy, okay? So let's say we have a stone. It's 0.1 kilograms, right? And it's dropped from a height of 10 meters. What will be the kinetic energy and potential energies of the stone at the height indicated in the figure without uh, wind resistance? And of course, we could figure this out using this equation right here, the EK plus EP, right? And we can figure out all that, uh, 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 figure out those variables and figure out what the energy is, right? But remember that at the moment the stone is released up here, right? The potential, the kinetic energy is actually zero because the stone hasn't, hasn't actually moved yet, right? But then also when the stone hits the ground, it's not moving anymore, right? And so now uh, uh, as the stone hits the ground, at the moment the stone hits the ground, right, the potential energy is zero because it's no longer any height to it, right? So you have to have height to have some kind of energy there, right? Uh, some kind of potential energy, right? But you also have to have kind of some kind of movement, right? To have uh, kinetic energy, okay? So just remember that right there. At the moment a stone is released or anything is released, what is the kinetic energy? It's zero, right? At the moment that the stone hits the ground, what is the potential energy? It's what? Zero, okay? It looks, it's, it's, it's almost like, it's almost counterintuitive, but just remember that kinetic energy is zero when it's released, right? And then potential energy is zero when it hits the ground. So we're going to take a look at these calculations. You don't have to do them. Just take a look at them. At 10 meters, 7 meters, uh, 3 meters, and 0 meters. So looking at it like this, right? Here we are at any height of the potential energy, of course. E equals, uh, EP equals MGH, mass times gravity times height. Right, so here we have the, the height at 10 meters, right? We multiply the 10 meters times the uh, uh, gravitational constant, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. If there's one thing I want you to take out of this class and remember for the rest of your life, it's the, it's the gravitational acceleration constant, which is 9.8 meters per second squared times 0.1, right? Which is the weight, or the, sorry, the mass of the, the mass of the stone, right? It gives us 9.8 joules, right? If we have it at seven and we plug in all seven meters and we put all those numbers in, we get a uh, we get a point uh, six point nine joules. If we put three in as the height, right, we get two point nine joules, and then we get zero in, we get zero joules, right? So that zero joules there, as you can see, is the same thing as talking about this right here, right? Where when you hit the ground and there's zero distance between the rock and the ground, right, the the potential energy is zero. But the thing I want you to notice also is this trend here, because I'll ask you about this on an exam, the trend here, right? As the stone is falling, what's happening? The kinetic energy goes down to zero, right? It starts to decrease, right? Does that make sense? So as height decreases, what else happens? Energy decreases, okay? As height decreases, energy decreases. So say you want to like, uh, say like you live in like a five-story apartment complex or something like that, right? And and your boyfriend did you wrong, right? Do you want him to, what, which energy level do you want him to be hitting the floor at, right? So the fifth floor, the fourth floor, the third floor. I mean, I guess if you, if you I guess if you still care about the guy, you could go to like maybe the second floor and it won't be that bad. But maximum energy, you know, into his, into his carcass that bad boyfriend of yours would be at the fifth floor or 10 meters in this case. Does that make sense? So that's the kind of question I might ask you in the exam. I'll give you a scenario like that, right? I don't know if it'd be about a bad boyfriend, but I'll give you some kind of scenario like that and ask you, you know, about the heights and how, how the, uh, the impact will affect the person. I mean, the thing getting hit at the, at the bottom, right? As height decreases, as height decreases, energy also decreases. Yes, energy also decreases. So the, basically the higher you are, the, 
the more painful it will be for the person falling, right? Or the lower you are, the less painful it will be for that person falling. That makes sense, right? So if we take a look at this, for example, this is just a, uh, this is just basically what I call like the you're welcome chart, right? Where it just shows you basically what you saw over here, right there, like an equation form, but now in chart form, right? Where, uh, 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 what was I thinking? What was I saying? Okay, here we go. Yeah. So the higher you are, right? The uh, This is the constant, uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. That's fine. And then here's the potential energy, right? The potential energy is super high up here at 9.8. And as you go down, it's lower, right? So uh, the interesting thing about this, though, is that <laughs> the kinetic energy is actually highest when you're the lowest, at the lowest. And so, and also the velocity, right, is highest when you're at the lowest, too. So the, the higher you are, the faster you can travel. So it's like, maybe you want to scare him a little more before he dies, right? And so you you uh, put him at the, uh, maybe at the 10th floor, and he just keeps kind of getting faster and faster and faster. <clears throat> anyway, so, but yes, good times, good times. So that, that, what, that's what I call that. All right, so here's your next question. As the height of the stone increases, the potential does what? The potential energy does what? As the height of the stone increases, the potential energy does what? Does it increase? Does it decrease? Does it remain unchanged? Or wait a second, I didn't even know stones had potential energy. I was gonna make a joke out of this one too, like rolling stones like have potential energy like the, the band, but I thought that might go over your head. I barely know what the Rolling Stones are, <laughs> so, and I'm older than you. Let's see how people are answering this question. That's okay if you got if you read it wrong. It's not for a grade or anything. I mean, it's for petition grade, but it's not participation grade, but it's not for. All right. Wow, everybody's already in. All right, so. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Somebody in Nancy was calling me. That's weird. Anyway, so um, looking at the uh, looking at the chart here, the answer would be that as the height of the stone increases, the potential energy actually increases, right? So the answer would be A. In the vast majority, you've got A. Good job. The vast majority, you've got A. Remember, the thing that actually does the opposite is the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy increases as you get higher, right? But for potential energy, it's the increase. The increase in height makes higher potential energy. The lower the uh, height, the lower the potential energy. But when you're talking about kinetic energy, uh, you actually get more kinetic energy the lower you get. So, so that's a it's a it's a backwards thing. It's the opposite for kinetic energy. So, looking at the the uh, the the uh, the uh, what was I thinking? What was I saying? Okay, but looking at the magnitude of the velocity, right? Because of, that's what we talk about when we're we're doing potential. I mean, kinetic energy, right? The reason why, so remember that potential energy is this equation right here, right? Which is the mg mass times gravity to, uh, times the change in height, right? But convert, but kinetic energy, right, is this equation, which is one half mass times the velocity squared, right? And the reason why it's backwards, the opposite for kinetic energy as far as height goes, is because the further you fall, right, the further you fall, the faster you're going, right? The faster you're going. And so since kinetic energy has this velocity term right here, right, velocity, it makes it so that kinetic energy is going to be bigger the faster you go, the faster a person is falling. And so it takes time. You know, you jump out of a plane, right, and you start out at some speed, right, but it takes you a second or two to get to actually the fastest you can go, right, while you're accelerating through the air. 
Okay. Since all potential energy is converted to kinetic energy just before hitting the ground, we can use this to compute the speed or the velocity of the magnitude, the magnitude of the velocity, right? And again, I'm not going to make you do any math here, but I just want you to see the relationships right here, right? You can say one half mass times volume, volume, sorry, one half mass times velocity squared equals uh, the uh, equals the uh, mass times the gravity times the uh, height of the object, right? Changing the height of the object. So what that means then is that your potential energy is going to equal your kinetic energy, which makes sense, right? That's that whole conservation of energy thing, right? It's constant, okay? So you can just cancel out the m's there, right? And then you can solve for solve for v right there by doing the square root, and then all you get left is v. And now you can figure out how fast the the the, the bad boyfriend was going when you dropped him from that height, right? So literally, right? Say so, so. Let's say. Uh, if you did live in a five-story building, right, like a five-story apartment complex, each floor is usually 10 feet, okay? That's how, how, how wide a floor is, right? And then between each floor is usually two or three feet, right? So let's just make it easy on ourselves since it's a five-foot floor, right, five-foot building, uh, sorry, five-story building, and you have five in between each, right? So two or three feet. So let's say three, two feet, that's another 10 feet right there, right? So that's 60 feet. Say that's how high a feet, feet. That doesn't sound right at all. That seems kind of small. Whatever. Let's say it was 60 feet. You, you drop your, your bad boyfriend from a height of 60 feet, right? Quite literally, all you have to do is plug in 60 feet there and then uh, use the gravitational constant of 9.8 meters per second squared multiplied by 2 and then take the square root of that and you can get how fast he was going when he hit the ground. It's a great time, right? It's a great time. I'm saying bad boyfriend because I've been a particularly bad boyfriend for the last couple of days. So I'm thinking of myself being thrown off the roof right now. So, um, yeah, she'll probably apologize to her. I mean, I did. I apologized this morning, right? But it's not enough. It's not enough. She's very upset at me right now. Anyway, so <laughs> she's probably thinking about throwing me off a 10-story building. So like more like more like 150 feet. All right, so. Moving forward here, we can talk about power now, right? We can talk about power. So power equals work divided by time, okay? And we talked about work a, sec a few slides ago, or last week, actually. Work is big W there, but specifically, it's big W that's italicized, right? Divided by time. But that also equals the force times the distance, right? Divided by time, right? So remember that ex example I was giving you a little while back last week. If I was pushing up against a, 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 a brick wall and the brick wall doesn't move at all, but I'm just exerting all this force, right? So I'm exerting 100,000 newtons of force on the wall, but the wall doesn't move anywhere. So D is zero, right? I'm doing no, no work at all. Does that make sense? Right? Because anything times zero is zero. Anything divided with a zero is zero, right? But... If I were to move this brick wall and I put 100 newtons of force through it, right, and it's moving across the ground, then I can say that my force, 10 newtons or something, times how far I moved it, divided by the time it took me to do it, right, will give me the power. Does that make sense? Right? So before you saw that work only equaled FD, the force times the distance, right? But now it can get power. And the only thing we have to do to get power is divide the time it took me to actually move that wall or whatever is moving the box. Okay. <clears throat> so the units for for work, right, is the joule seconds, which makes sense because joules is uh, a unit of uh, energy, and then seconds is how much time, right? But the thing I don't want you to get confused with is that. The italicized uppercase W is is uh, work, right? But the unitalicized unitalicized W uppercase is watts. Okay, is watts. So most people can just say Newton seconds really is watts, right? I mean, that's sorry, not Newton seconds, joule seconds. Joule seconds is just watts, right? And so one joule second equals one watt. And that's the same watt we're talking about when we're talking about light bulbs, okay? When we're talking about light bulbs. So here, for example, 
a hundred watt light bulb uses a hundred watts of hundred sorry a hundred watt light bulb uses one hundred joule seconds of electrical power or one hundred watts. And did you know? I actually just learned this today. The human body actually emits about as much heat as a hundred watt light bulb, right? So whenever you're stuck in the cold, like we were in February, right? It actually is true. If you get naked and press up against your friends, it will warm you up. Okay? It will warm you up. Okay? It's, the, thing, the problem is that if you have your clothes on, there's not enough thermal contact, right? So you, gotta, you really do have to get naked and do it. Um, but it works because you're, man, you're admitting a, a hot you know, a light bulb, man. You know what I mean? It's pretty hot. You know? It's pretty hot. The other things that emit a lot of heat, too, are like little dogs. Like, I, I have a big dog, right? G German Shepherd, he, Yogi, he doesn't emit any heat at all. Like, you touch him, he feels cold. But my little Corgi and my little Chihuahua Lini dog, oh, my God, they're like heaters. They're like portable heaters. I have, to, I have to, like, kick them off the bed at night because they're so hot and I can't sleep when they're on the bed. And I have a purple mattress. That, that's supposed to be cold. Okay, so just to reiterate... Be careful not to confuse the italicized W as work with the unitalicized uppercase W for watt, okay? So, a force of one newtons, right, to raise a mass of one meter, right? Force of one newton to raise a mass of one meter. So that's what we're happening here, right? We have this guy here, he's pulling this rope on this pulley to pull up this weight right here. And he's pulling with a force of one Newton, right? And the work done is one joule, right? The work done is one joule when he does that, okay? If this work is done in one second, then the power is one watt, right? So if it took this guy one second to pull this, this, the, this, this weight or whatever this thing is, anvil, I don't know, on, from this rope here, if he's pulling that pulley with that weight on there and it took him one second to move one meter, right, with a force of one newton, then you get one power as a watt. One power is a watt. No, you get one watt as a power, right? One watt is a power. Okay. So these are the, the watts, the watts. These are the, um, these are the, uh, the, the units that we use for, uh, Everything we've talked about so far. So the force, you know, the, the force is uh, newtons, right? With the symbol N for newtons. And the actual equivalent is kilograms, meters per second square, right? The work uh, quantity, joule, is joules still with a J. And you've heard me say this before too, the newton meter, right? The newton meter. Energy is also the joule, right? J. And then also the newton meter, right? And the new one we just talked about just now. Power is watt or W. And its unit is joules seconds. Okay? Its unit is joules seconds. Okay? Oh, man. Now we've got to talk about the British system. Okay? We've got to talk about the British system. In the British system, work is actually in the foot pound. Right, and we've talked about that before. I was talking to you before about the torque wrenches that we use to uh, break uh, uh, bolts and lug nuts and stuff from the, the, the your spare tire. Right, the higher the foot pounds, the easier it is for you to on the wrench. The easier it is for you to loosen up a bolt or a lug nut. Right, and the way you make it so that there's more foot pounds of torque, you can just uh, extend the wrench. Right, make the wrench longer. Right, but the point is for this slide. Right? For power, since the British system uses foot pounds for work, for power, remember that the only difference between power and work is that power is work divided by time. Right? And so for the British system, power is the foot pound divided by seconds. Okay? And I bet you didn't know this because I didn't know this, but maybe you did because you're like car gurus, right? Horsepower is commonly used for the for power in the British system. Right? Power in the British system. And so one horsepower actually equals 550 foot-pound seconds, which also equals 760 watts. Did you know that? I didn't know that until now, right? So my car has a – I have an FJ Cruiser, a Toyota FJ Cruiser. And 
I think it maxes at like 150 horsepower or something like that. And so I don't know what that is, but that's a lot of watts. That's a lot of watts, okay? The greater the power of an engine, the faster it will do work. So a two horsepower engine will do twice as much work as a one power horsepower engine of the same amount of time. So when you see these kinds of engines right here, they're two horsepower and one horsepower, that are actually like lawnmower engines, you know? Lawnmower engines have that kind of power. Uh, another thing that has that kind of power too uh, is a go-kart. Back when I was little, my dad brought, bought my brother and I a go-kart that was like a two-seater. And let me just tell you, I wasn't that good at driving go-karts at the time. And I crashed it right into the garage door. Like two days after we got it, I crashed it right into the garage door. And so the garage door is all bent up out of shape like this, all like, you know, confungled and stuff. And uh, and that dad, dad was very upset about buying me that go kart after I destroyed the garage door, so yeah. But then like the then then the go kart got stolen by somebody in the neighborhood, and then we found it, and then I had to drive it back home, and then I crashed into the garage door again. Anyway, so I, I think the brakes weren't working on that go kart for some reason. I'm really sure. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that the the brakes weren't working on that thing. The other thing I wanted to talk about here too with horsepower is. Um, I feel like I saw back a long time ago, maybe it was like Blue's Clues or something like that on a on some kind of kids TV show on PBS when they were talking about horsepower. And they were saying that the reason why they call it horsepower is because it's like the power of a horse pulling like a person or something like that. Uh, and if the if it takes like two horses to pull something, that's two horses, two horsepower. If it's three horses, it's four horsepower or something like that. I don't know if that's true or not because it was a kid's show. But, you know, maybe it was Bill Nye the Science Guy. I don't know. Somebody look that up sometime. You don't have to do it now. Just I'm just wondering. So the next question is this. What unit does not match the quantity? What unit does not match the quantity? This one should be pretty easy. Let's see how everybody does. Oh, there are 22 people in here. I thought there were 21 people. Unless someone answered twice. Which is fine. I don't care. Twelve responses so far. Twelve responses so far. 20 responses so far, 21 responses, woo -hoo. And again, the vast majority of you got that correct. The only one here that is incorrect is D, right? Uh, what is, the, what is the, uh, the unit for power? Exactly, it's the watt, good job, good job, good job. Did, was, did people get that one wrong? I wasn't trying to trick you or anything. Why would you be surprised? It was like the two slides ago. <laughs> this, it was the exact same chart. All I did was put A, B, C, and D on the side of it, you know? It was the same chart. <laughs> Have more faith in yourself. Have more faith in yourself. Okay, so I'm not going to make you do this math, but I just want to go through with you how to do it, right? Um, so let's say I have a constant force of 150 newtons, and it's used to push a student's stalled motorcycle 10 meters along a flat road in 20 seconds. Calculate the power expended in watts, right? Which is actually funny because when I was in when I was at grad school in in Auburn, for some reason the police really encouraged you to get a motorcycle to drive around campus, and so a parking permit for like a car was like three hundred dollars at Auburn, right? But a parking permit for a motorcycle was like twenty dollars, so they really encouraged you to get. And there was motorcycle parking everywhere, so they really encouraged you to get a motorcycle when you're in Auburn on the Auburn campus. So anyway, back to this. So how do we figure this one out? It's pretty simple, right? Because remember, we have this equation here, P power equals the work divided by, or work? The, yes, the work. See, even I just got confused, right? This is italicized, so that's work, right? Watts is not italicized. So the work divided by the time, right? And it's also the distance times the force divided by the time. You can use either one, right? So we're going to use this one right here, P here, right? All you have to do is plug in 150 there for 150 newtons. The distance, D, 10 meters, 20 seconds at the bottom, and you got 75 watts. 75 watts. 
right? Good stuff, good stuff. Pretty simple equation, pretty simple work there, okay? So, let's try another one. A student expends 7.5 watts of power lifting a textbook. <laughs> they are pretty heavy, I guess. Uh, 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 lifting a textbook, 0.5 meters in one second. Like, I guess he's he or she is lifting it up like this, right, from the table. It took them a sec less than a second, maybe. How much work is being done, and how much does how much does the book weigh in newtons, right? This is pretty simple again, too. We can use all the same equations again, right? What's wrong? Is everything okay? Okay. Uh, we can use all the same equations again, right? So remember that wa uh, work here, right, and weight right here, right? You can find the work and the weight. You're given the 7.5 watts. You're given the distance, and you're given the time, right? And so here we have the work right here, which is P times one second, and that gives you the 75 I mean, sorry, 7.5 joules, right? And then you can easily find the weight because uh, the work times the dis distance and the force gives you the weight. And so uh, 7.5 divided by, uh, oh, so you have to actually rearrange it so that you get force by itself, right? And then you get 7.5 divided by 0.5 equals 15 newtons, right? So all I'm showing you here is that you can figure out all this kind of stuff with all the same equation, right? All the same equation. So, the next question is this. Up until now, what does P power equal? What does P power equal? Let's see here. I'm so glad you're all participating so actively today. I mean, you don't have a choice, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Fifteen responses already. Seventeen people have responded. Kate just taking up five chairs while she's laying across. <laughs> so Gloria can't sit down. <laughs> I saw, I saw that. Which I'm perfectly fine with you getting comfortable in the class. It's fine. You know? This should be like watching Bill and I, the science guy, something that's interesting, you know, something that's fun. All right, 20 people have responded. 21 people, 20, 20 people? Yeah, 20 people have responded. I'll just go ahead and show it to you now. The answer is, in fact, C, right? So good job. But also good job for the rest of you, too, who didn't pick C, because both of those are actually the correct answer, too. So you knew that one of them, at least, was work, right, or power, right? So, yes, both of these are equal to power, right? Work divided by time is power, but force times distance is also the same thing as work, right? And so when it's divided by time, it's also power. So good job, good on you guys. Good on you guys. But I am happy though that the that very many of you uh, uh, did get the answer completely correct. Did someone miss a question? We still needed the 21 people, there's only 20 people. Well, there was 21 before she got here. I'll let you scan it real quick, Gloria. That way I can show you're actually here today. Did you get it? Did it scan? Okay. The answer is C, by the way. It's just so you know. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. So let's talk about electrical energy now, right? Let's talk about electrical energy. Let's talk about electrical energy. Oh, because we're doing a lab today about electricity. It's going to be great. It's a great time, okay? Power, right? 
up until now, power was just work divided by time or, or force times distance divided by time, right? But now power equals this. It equals electricity produced or consumed divided by the time it took you to do that, right? You can rearrange it again, of course, right? This equation, you can re rearrange it like you did before where E now, right? The electricity or energy, right? Uh, produced or consumed equals the power to, uh, times time. You can rearrange it that way, okay? But the thing that I want you really to take note of here is that power, of course, is given in watts, right? And so you can do you can do joules seconds times joule sorry joule seconds times seconds, which gives you which gives you watts seconds. That's confusing. And then you get the big J for joules, right? But the big J are the units of working energy, right? But the bigger unit here is actually called the kilowatt hour. That's the one I really want you to remember, the kilowatt hour. Okay, does kilowatt hour sound familiar to you? If you have an apartment and you're paying electricity or house and you're paying electricity right now, you're paying by the kilowatt hour, right? If you have TXU or, 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 or center point energy or, or Intergy or energy, I can't remember all the electricity companies. So whatever. Mine's TXU, of course, right? And right now I'm paying 11 cents per kilowatt hour, right? So And so that's not something that you can actually calculate because the electricity people come out to your house and look at this gauge that's on the side of your house and it shows how much electricity you consumed, right? And I, I mean, my house is full of electronics. It's full. And we're always blasting the AC. And it's, so I'm using at least three, 4,000 kilowatt hours every month. My electricity bill is like two or $300 a month, right? It's crazy, okay? But every single thing that you turn off, as far as lights go, TVs go, I don't know why, but my house has like four TVs running at the same time all the time. You know, computers, all that kind of stuff. You turn that stuff off and you start to make the kilowatt hours go down, right? And then your electricity gets better. So I don't know if you remember this, but back when we had that big freeze in February, there's all these people that were complaining about the fact that their electricity bill is going to be like skyrocketing, right? And the reason why they were talking about that is because for most people, when you get on an electricity plan, you have a plan where it's like a flat rate of 11 cents per kilowatt hour, right? Or, uh, or, uh, or, or uh, some people have a little bit higher so they can get like free weekends or something like that. But mostly it's the same. Well, there was this big group of people in Texas, right, that were on this power company called Gritty. Right, and they would actually sell you the electricity based on the wholesale price of electricity, not a constant price of electricity. And so they were actually, uh, they were actually doing uh, electricity for like instead of like the normal eleven or twelve cents an hour, qu qu kilowatt hour, they were selling it to people during normal times at like a penny or two cents per kilowatt hour. So imagine the savings you were getting, right, when you uh. When you were uh, 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 when you were on gritty during like a, uh, a normal time, but then what happened was we had that huge power outage, right? And the price of electricity skyrocketed, like it went up way high because there wasn't enough. The entire Texas power grid went down, and there was no 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 electricity. So that 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 whole price of electricity that <laughs> the wholesale price of electricity that gritty was charging their customers, which was used to be like one to two cents per kilowatt hour, went up to like three or four dollars per kilowatt hour. Right, and so now people with like houses like mine, two thousand kilowatt hours a month, two thousand times three three dollars for a kilowatt hour, right? You got a six thousand dollar pretty electricity bill, right? So that's that's the reason why that happened, and so everybody's really pissed off about gritty. They're still trying to sell their 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 they're still trying to sell their um, their electricity so cheap, right? Because they don't think there's going to be another deep freeze. Right, like we had, but and my thing is, if, if it happened once in February, it's going to happen again, right? And so, my point here is this: don't get on a variable power plan where you can they, can they can change your rate, your kilowatt hour rate, right? Just get one where it's like the same eleven cents or twelve cents per kilowatt hour, so that it doesn't shoot up to like three or four dollars per kilowatt hour in cold times, right? Because uh, I don't know if you notice this, but our winters are getting colder and our summers are getting hotter, right? So, <laughs> so having having the, the the benefit of having one two cents per kilowatt hour during the time since it's not extreme, it's not worth the six thousand dollars you know electricity bill in the winter or in the summer. You know what I mean? It's crazy.
absolutely crazy. So you can take a uh, you can take a horsepower, right? And you can of the electric motor it runs for twelve hours, right? And you can convert it then to kilowatt hours, the same kind of kilowatt hours that you get charged every month on your electricity bill, right? Find the energy in kilowatt hours, right? We learned before that one horsepower equals how many watts? 746 watts. That was like five slides ago. It's okay if you didn't remember. I didn't either until it said it right here, so it's fine, right? That makes it so we can change it to just uh, kilowatts, right? And so now we know that the amount of energy in one horsepower, one horsepower electric motor is 7.46 kilowatts, right? And now I want to see what the kilowatt hours is. I just multiply that by the time and I get 7.5 kilowatt hours. Okay, 7.5 kilowatt hours. And that's how you figure out how much energy you've used, right? It's, it's kind of a good thing. Kind of a good thing, right? So, um, how far have we gotten here? Well, we're, we're in pretty far. We're going to finish this today. I'm so excited. So, no matter what type of energy that we speak of, electrical, chemical, or mechanical, the main unifying concept is energy conservation, right? Or conservation of energy. We cannot create or destroy energy, but we can change it from one thing to another, okay? Whether it's chemical, electrical, or mechanical energy, the main unifying concept is the conservation of the energy. We cannot create or destroy it, but we can change it from one form to another, okay? All right, so your next question. What type of energy falls under the main unifying concept of the conservation of energy? I expect everyone to get this one right. I didn't even change, change anything. All right, let's see how people are answering this one, the one that I ex expect everybody to get right. Are you, is everybody not working? Try it again, try it again. Yeah, I've got 12 responses, so it's definitely working. Oh, wow, that was fast. 21% already, I mean, 21 responses. All right, I expected that everybody would get this one right because it was just the previous slide, but two people did answer it incorrectly. <laughs> That's okay, though. I'll take what I can get, right? It's definitely all the all the above, right? Each one of these is listed in that line that I had up here. See, uh, chemical, electrical, mechanical. Chemical, electrical, mechanical, so it's all of these. All of those. All right, so let's talk about some forms of energy now, right? Let's talk about some forms of energy. We've got thermal energy, heat energy. It's it's related to kinetic and potential energy, right? At the on the molecular level, right? On the molecular level. We've got the gravitational potential energy, which we talked about before. It's the uh, how high something is, and then it falls, and the more it falls, the higher it falls. It has more stored energy, right? The potential gravitational potential energy. Okay, we've got electrical energy, which is associated with the motion of electric charges, right? Associated with the motion of electric charges. We've got chemical energy, right? And molecular bonds, and we're just talking about ATP gets broken, one of the phosphates comes off, and you release all this energy, and if you didn't do that, you'd be dead, right? Then the sun, of course, has a whole bunch of energy, radiant energy coming towards us. And it's called electromagnetic radiation because the entire gambit of sunlight has all of the electromagnetic radiation, right? From gamma rays that makes the Hulk all the way to the microwave that you use to cook your food at lunchtime, right? It's all from the, the sun has all that stuff, right? It goes like gamma rays, X-rays, UV, and then Roy G. Biv, the colors, right? 
and then it goes to infrared, microwaves, then radio waves, or something like that. I may have gotten that out of order, but I'm pretty close. And then we got nuclear energy, right? Nuclear energy is literally the breaking apart, right, or the putting together, fission and fusion, of nuclei. And that actually creates a crap ton of energy too, right? A crap ton of energy, right? So let's just be clear about this right here, right? Fission, I, and I used to get this confused all the time, right? Fission is the breaking apart of a larger nuclei, right? Something like plutonium or something that's super heavy, you can drop it on a, uh, on a, uh, use it as a like an atomic bomb type of thing, a nuclear weapon, right? That's the breaking apart of, of a nuclei, that's called fission. That has tons of energy, tons of energy, right? Have you ever seen the very first, oh no, maybe the second Terminator 2 movie? Second Terminator, that was redundant. The second Terminator movie, right? There's there's a, what they call the nuclear holocaust and all those people died from that nuclear explosion in that movie, right? That's a crap ton of energy there. And then fusion, just like it sounds like, right? Our smaller nuclei that get rammed into other nuclei, right? And that collision makes energy. But the cool thing about that is that when it happens, when it happens, it causes this chain reaction. So all these other things to start colliding with each other. And that causes a crap ton of energy too. Okay. I think the best example of a nuclear nuclear power would be from, uh, well, of course there's Chernobyl, right? But the, the more fun one is the one where Homer Simpson works in a nuclear power plant, right? All right. So then we got the fossil fuels. They get a Get a whole slide to themselves, the fossil fuels do, right? And the fossil fuels, they're, they're oil, gas, and coal, right? And the reason why they're called fossil fuels is because they came from fossils. They literally came from fossils. From once living organisms basically stored uh, solar and chemical energy, right? So say I die and my body falls to the ground and I'm like absorbing all this energy from the sun and the chemistry. Right, I'm just dying. I'm decomposing, right? And then all the stuff gets like put on top of me. All these layers of work, uh, sand and dirt and rocks. And after 365 million years, I'm under like you know 25,000 metric tons of dirt, right? And you dig me up, and the only thing you find of me left is oil. Literally, that's how that works. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what the fossil fuels are. Anyway, oil. From marine organisms, right? U.S. imports more than 50% of the of our oil needs, or imports more than 50% of our oil needs. Speaking of oil, did you hear there was an oil uh, an oil spill in California that just happened like few a few hours ago? Like they think that an anchor of a boat or something like crashed into like a a pipeline underwater and literally caused a huge oil spill. Absolutely crazy, right? Bad stuff, man. Bad stuff. We're going to have to get some Dawn out there to clean up the animals. Some Dawn dish soap. Did I tell you? I actually use Dawn dish soap to clean my dogs. Like, I give them baths using Dawn dish soap. It's awesome. I, I said that before. I'm starting to refute myself. Oh, good. It's not a bad idea. Like, it actually works better than actual, like, animal soap. Like, dog soap. Don't use dog soap. Just use that Dawn. I mean, I truly trust that, that the label they have of the duck, you know? You know? And they're cleaning the, the duck with the... It's such a cute duck, too. So how can you say no, right? How can you say no to that? So I'm all about that kind of thing. Gas, also for marine organisms. Produced, most of it is produced domestically. My uncle actually works for Shell Oil. He makes a gazillion dollars. He's like a, the chief engineer at Shell Oil. Down in Pearland in, in, in near Houston, Texas, it smells like butthole down there. But they make a lot of money where it smells like butthole. I almost said, I almost said the, a bad word there, but... But it does smell really bad down in Pearland, right? Uh, but yeah, it smells really bad down in Pearland. But he lives down there, and he's pretty rich. He's okay with it, right? He's like, I get paid enough money to be living in smelly worlds here, so whatever. You know, he likes it. Coal uh, from terrestrial plants, right? U.S. has a large reserves of coal, but the environment has problems with co the environmental problems with, co with coal mining, right? Everybody has problems with coal mining. In fact, I mean. Uh, people can't really do coal mining that much either. Isn't that where you get like the, they had that weird thing where it was like a canary inside of the coal mines, right? And it was like chirping or something or died inside the coal mine. You had to leave the coal mine because of like chemical problems, something like that. 
methane hydrate, crystalline form of natural gas and water uh, and water, right? Research on possible usage. That's kind of cool. I didn't know that was happening. We also have food energy. Man, these people are eating some really big sandwiches. Oh, those look like those Subway sandwiches? No, actually, those look like Vietnamese sandwiches, those Ben Mies. I might get one of those when I get to go home today, actually. It's kind of good. Looks really good. But that's a huge sandwich, man. Slow down, whoever you are. So, which of the following is not a fossil fuel? Which of the following is not a fossil fuel? Wow, guys, I am so happy. We're going to get through like 66 slides in one day. I, I, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, I feel like we're talking a lot. I mean, that's my job, but we're we're really behind, so that's why I'm excited about it. All right, let's see how we answered this. Which of the following is not a fossil fuel? Which of the following is not a fossil fuel? I've got 20 responses already. And yes, once again, the vast majority of you've got that correct. Nuclear energy is definitely not a fossil fuel, right? Definitely not a fossil fuel. I think Homer Simpson would be a lot safer if he were, or I guess I think Springfield would be a lot safer, him being the safety manager at a nuclear power point plant. He'd be a, be a lot safer if it wasn't a nuclear power plant. So yes, nuclear power is definitely not a fossil fuel. So let's talk about some consumptions. Look at this craziness here, all right? The United States fuel consumption, okay? Approximate relative fuel consumption in the US. We consume, of all of our fuel consumption, 38%, 37% of it is oil. 24% of it is natural gas. That's like in our stoves and stuff like that, our gas stoves, which are great, by the way, right? I'm a big proponent of using a gas stove because you can turn the, the heat, it's exactly right, you know, a perfect amount of heat. Whereas if you have one of those electric stoves, it's like high, medium, low. I mean, I can't work with that. Come on, right? Coal energy, 23%. Nuclear energy, 8.5. And renewables. Anybody know what the renewables are? Yes, exactly. Solar, wind power, you know, that kind of thing. Hydroelectric, the renewable ones. No one wants to use renewable power for some reason, right? Did I get on a Did I get on a tirade about solar power last a couple weeks ago? About people selling solar power, it's like. That might have been somewhere else. I, I, I teach so many classes, I forget. Fuels for electrical generation. Mostly in the U.S., we use coal, right, to do, fuel, uh, to, yeah, duh, to do electrical generation. Natural gas, 21%. Nuclear energy, 24%. That's actually higher than I thought. We use 20% of our energy comes from nuclear power. Hydroelectric, 6%. Petroleum oil, 1%. And other renewables, 3%. But, of course, by sector, industry uses... The most power out of all of us, right? Transportation right here, 24%. And us right here, me and you, commercial and residential, only 32%. Okay? Okay, so what type of fuel is used most in electricity generation? What type of fuel is used most in electri electricity generation? I expect everyone to get this one right too because we just talked about it. So far, so good. So far, so good. Oh, dang it. <laughs> 18 people so far. 19 people so far. Still 19 people so far. 20 people. I'll just do it around. 20 people. Uh, 21 people now. So, again, the vast majority of you got that one correct there. Of course, the answer is coal, right? The answer is coal because I said that right here. Remember? Uh, coal right here, the big purple, right? 49%, right? So, remember that. <laughs> All right. So, let's talk about some alternative or renewable energy sources, right? And these are sources of energy that are not based on fossil fuels or nuclear processes, okay? And since they're renewable, these are sources that cannot be exhausted because eventually we'll run out of nuclear power. 
because we'll run out of nuclear uh, the nuclear elements to do nuclear power, number one. But really, it's the fossil fuels that we're going to run out of, right? Eventually, they're going to be we're going to run out of you know dead bodies of me underground for you to you know pull nuclear um, pull fossil fuels out of, right? So in large part, these types of energies overlap. Okay, the first type of renewable energy is hydropower. Okay, uses the gravitational potential energy of water flowing downhill to produce gravity. And I was telling you about this before, where uh, where uh, where we were driving over at Hoover Dam, and that thing is mother huge, and it's pro it's making all kinds of electricity over Hoover Dam over in Nevada. Good stuff right there. But the problem is though, there's some ecological and environmental damage that gets done when you build a dam, right? And then also, uh, it actually takes up a lot of agricultural land, so the farmers get displaced. And we need farmers because I want my chickens. Did you guys hear that there's like a shortage of chickens right now? Like, that's crazy. And it's so crazy that we have a chicken shortage. I'm so sad. So here's a picture of a dam, right? In Utah, Fla Flaming, 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 Flaming George Dam, whatever. Anyway, see, there's water back there, right, in this reservoir. And here's water down here in this little river here. And the water flows from here to here, over here, right? But there's like turbines inside. Right, that rotate because of the water, and when those turbines rotate, it creates energy, creates electricity. Right, good stuff. But imagine all the the land and the the the, the farm power, the farm land that's all gone now. I mean, no more room for chickens. Right. Then we have wind power. Right. I don't know if you've seen this, but on the highway these days, I'm always seeing a huge wind turbine. Oh my God! Funny thing. Funny story. <laughs> So my first day working at Dallas County Crime Lab, I go into the, the shooting range, you know, where we shoot things, and there's this huge, like, blade propeller on the ground, a huge one. So what the heck is this for? So it turned out what happened was that some crazy person was shooting at a wind turbine, right, Like, and, and put bullet holes into the wind turbine. And so the company that owns the wind turbine gave us the, the big thing, the big, like, tur propeller blade from the wind turbine. So we could match the bullet holes to the bullets of the person that was shooting the, the wind turbine, which we did, because we're that good, right? So what that means to you is that if you're out there shooting, don't shoot at wind turbines. We'll catch you, okay? We'll catch you. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. I mean, usually we're going after murderers, but I guess we had a slow day that day, right? Anyway, not particularly aesthetic, of course, because wind turbines are huge, right? Must be located uh, where the wind is sufficiently strong, which I think here in DFW, it's super windy. Like, I feel like my basketball goals is flying over every time. And then has thousands, oh, minor environmental effects has been used for thousands of years to grind grains and pump water, right? And that's just, you know, like windmills and stuff, right? Like the one I used to uh, investigate the hauntings of, right? Oh, and here, this, this, see, that's what I'm talking about. It's this thing right here. We have one of these in our shooting range. You think after we solved the crime, they would have just taken it back, but they just left it with us. So now we have a huge wind turbine propeller in the crime lab, just sitting there for no reason at all. So <laughs> I don't know why they didn't just take it. Then we have solar power, right? Very promising future source of reliable economic energy. Although some solar power isn't used now, many more applications are possible. And so the thing I want to talk about with solar power is um, don't fall for the people coming to your house door to door asking you to you know, no money out of the pocket, install solar panels on your house. It's a scam. Don't do it, okay? Because it may be no money out of pocket right then and there, but the way they're paying for you to have the solar power is because it's under this thing called the PACE grant from the, the federal government. So they say, oh, you're getting this, you're getting this, this, the solar panels are free. You'll save so much electricity, blah, 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 right? Uh, and But you're not really getting it for free because you're getting it through a, a, a government-funded grant, but it's actually a loan. Right, so as soon as you install those the solar panels, you're gonna you're 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 now on the uh, on the on the hook for the electricity bill. I'm not the electricity bill, but the price of those solar panels over time. That's why it's not like straight out of pocket. So what they're doing is they're hoping that your electricity bill will your lower electricity bill will offset the cost of the <laughs> the loan that you used to buy the, the the solar power, right? But it never does. It never does because solar power, uh, these are called photovoltaic cells. They're freaking expensive, right? 
So don't fall for that. Unless you're like independently wealthy and you don't have to take the loan, then you can go ahead and buy it with your all the money you got. But definitely don't use a pace loan to do that because a lot of people go bankrupt trying to pay off this pace loan. And since it's like a government loan, like you can't like discharge it with like bankruptcy. You can't do any of that stuff, right? Because it's a government loan. It's just like your student loans, right? You ever notice that? Your student loans can't be discharged either through bankruptcy, right? The only way you get rid of a student loan is by dying, right? <laughs> so it's the same thing with a pace loan. To do, a, to do a, a solar panels, be careful of that. Don't fall for it. They really prey on like elderly people. Elderly people that are like, oh yeah, no money out of pocket. I'll get the thing. But then, you know, I, it, really, it really annoys me. Anyway, we've got geothermal energy. So that's, ener that's the, uh, 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 the energy that's in the ground, right? That's why it's called geothermal, right? Very site specific though. Depends on large natural change in temperature uh, being present and accessible. It's exclusively only used in Iceland, right? So here we go. Here we have this. There's some here using in uh, in Hawaii, right? My mom and my mom and her sugar daddy just got back from Hawaii, and uh, and uh, 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 I guess they are not. They're using some hydroelectric, not hydroelectric, geothermal power there, right? And then there's tidal energy, reliable, predictable, must be designed to handle bidirectional tidal currents, right? And tidal currents have been generating, like, generating electricity in the Rance River in France since the 1960s. I didn't even know that. That's cool. Then we have biofuels, right? Uh, so my uncle who works at Shell actually works in their biofuels division, right? And so they're actually taking things like algae and turning it into gasoline. Is that crazy? Right? Totally crazy, right? So biofuels like corn, sugarcane, and other plants can be used to make ethanol. Basically the same thing you're doing to make ethanol that you drink, right? But instead of doing that, uh, instead of using a, a drinking it, you're going to, you know, put it in your gas in your car, right? That's why, like, what is it now? 10% of your gasoline is ethanol, I think now, right? Back then, though, back 100 years ago, yeah, not 100 years ago, but maybe, maybe 50, 60 years ago, uh, instead of having ethanol in gasoline, it actually had this thing called ethyl, um, ethyl um, lead. Tetraethyl lead, right? And so uh, people were playing with lead. People used to burn things and, and put gasoline on it and had lead in it, tetraethyl lead on it. Um, the, the guy who invented tetraethyl lead gasoline, leaded gasoline, would, would demonstrate how safe it was, right? By, play, by washing his hands in gasoline. Crazy bastard, right? But it turns out that lead's very dangerous for you, right? It actually turns you crazy. Nuts, right? Lead does when it gets absorbed into your skin, right? And so that's, I think that's actually where the, the term, the Mad Hatter comes from in England, right? The Mad Hatter. Anyway, the point is, right? They don't use lead and gasoline anymore because of that. So that's why when you look at the gasoline and it says 87 octane, right? It also says unleaded, right? It says unleaded. And the reason why it is unleaded is because they found out a little while ago that it's dangerous, right? It's absolutely dangerous. It causes people to go nuts. Like get, go dement, like have dementia and stuff. And guess who figured that out? A forensic scientist figured that out, a guy named uh, Norris and Gettler, right? And they, they, they were seeing all these people, these forensic scientists seeing all these people working in gasoline factories and people working in cars going nuts. And they were like, what's going on here? Why are people going nuts? Right? And they did a forensic investigation and figured out all these people are poisoned with lead from gasoline. Isn't that crazy? Right? So that's why your gasoline now doesn't have lead in it anymore. It has ethanol right there. Okay. And depending on the plant that's processed, more energy may be used in the production of ethanol and uh, 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 ethanol by burning et ethanol itself. Okay. Uh, another one that we have here is called uh, biomass. I used to call it bioconversion. It's about the same thing, right? Any organic matter that's available on renewable basis is considered biomass. So biomass includes agricultural crops, wood, animals, water, municipal waste, aquatic plants. All that stuff can be generated into energy. So one of the things that this is, <laughs> I actually saw a Criminal Minds episode about this recently, right? Where, uh, and we actually did it as an experiment before, where you could actually take like fat from like used fat or oil from like a fast food restaurant, you know, where they use the deep fry fries and chicken strips and you know, stuff like that. Use fry fat, right? Fry oil, deep fryer oil. And you can actually add some, uh, some chemicals to it and, and, and then heat it up. And it does this thing called um, uh, fatty acid methyl esterase, or sorry, fatty acid methyl, uh, what does E stand for? Ester, right? Fatty acid methyl ester. 
And what a fatty acid methyl ester is, is quite literally a, a, a biofuel, right? Because you can actually take that and turn it, and it's actually called biodiesel, and you can take that and put it into your diesel vehicles. So if you have a diesel vehicle, like a diesel truck, a lot of like F-350s are diesel trucks, right? You can actually take fry oil, right? Add in some acid, right, to the fry oil, heat it up, it'll turn it into, uh, it'll turn it into a biodiesel, and you can literally just throw it straight into your diesel vehicle, and it'll work, right? You don't have to pay for gas anymore because diesel fuel is expensive. I don't know if you knew that, but diesel fuel is expensive, right? And so in this, <laughs> in this particular Criminal Minds episode, they were trying to go after this, this, this family that was like living in West Virginia, right? The backwoods of West Virginia. And, and the big secret was that the, the head of one family of West Virginia and the other head of the other family were like brother and sister, right? But they like had a relationship, right? And then the sister got pregnant and then she had to move away and become the head of another family. And then there was this battle between them. And the reason why there was a battle between them is because they were rivals with the biofuel industry. Like, because they, it used to be prohibition where they were trying to make like a uh, uh, moonshine, right? But now they changed over something even more lucrative, which is biodiesel, right? Because it turns out that a lot of people that have trucks use diesel. And they also did this on, on um, <laughs> they did this on Mythbusters too, where they took, they literally took some, some fry oil and just, did the little the little a uh, little biofuel experiment and threw it into a, a diesel car and it worked right. So, good stuff, good stuff. That actually ends today's lecture, right? These are some of the the uh, the, the equations we went over today. Um, you don't have to memorize them at all, but those are it, right? And if you have lab with me, I will see you in a few minutes.